SBC Media. Welcome to the iGaming Daily podcast, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming market. Massachusetts regulators broke new ground this week when they hosted a range of speakers to discuss the issue of limiting betters. They are the first regulator to take a look into the issue, which, depending on who you ask, either affects a minuscule number of people or is a widespread tactic to ensure that just about any successful better can't wager. We've got the highlights of the discussion, plus our own thoughts on what comes next on today's episode of iGaming Daily. Uh, shout out to the sponsor of iGaming Daily, Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming market. You can get your free first month of Optimove by clicking the link in the description below. Now that we've properly thanked them, I am Jessica Wellman, editor of SBC Americas, joined by media manager Charlie Horner. And I feel like it's kind of weird being back in the saddle. It's been a minute since we've done one of these. The dream team is back. Yeah, it's, they, it's been a few weeks. They couldn't handle us. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. You know, sometimes I can't handle the MGC to to do a segue on this one. Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Charlie, you're not in the news rotation as much anymore, but I did make you tune back into the, the, the meetings that just keep on giving for this discussion on limiting betters. Now that you've dipped your toe back in uh, and you kind of knew what to expect with the MGC, what was your overall impression of this meeting and how it went? Well, I think First of all, it's it's. We should point out that it's a positive that um, the operators turned up. Because, yes, they they um, did try this in May, and Bally's came. Bally's came this time, by the way, and did not say a word. Like <laughs> they introduced themselves and then said nothing. Ditto, uh, Pen and ESPN bed. Yeah, I think that's that's quite interesting in itself as well. That a couple of operators joined the discussion but weren't willing to participate uh but generally i thought the discussion was um it was it was really interesting to see how you know what the operators would actually say um because clearly from the past they would rather keep um their cards close to their chest on this um and they weren't really willing to delve into too many specifics uh just a couple of statistics here and there i think bet mgm said that they only limited around 1% of bettors in Massachusetts, whereas FanDuel was saying that this was affecting around 0.04% of... So it's a, they're kind of different statistics, not to nitpick you, but to yeah. what the statistic Corey Fox of FanDuel gave was that 0.043% of the bets on FanDuel were placed at the maximum amount that they could wager. Mm -hmm. meaning, you know, the vast majority of people, the amount that they wanted to bet, they bet and they didn't, you know, hit the cap. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was quite interesting to see how the two sides of this debate were laying out their arguments because it was very much the operator saying that, look, yeah, we do limit betters, but it's only a very, very, it's a percentage of a percentage was the phrase that was repeated quite often. It's, it's a really small number of betters who are actually being limited. There's not this huge problem. We're well within our rights to do this. And then on the, on the other side, you had the regulators sort of saying, well, actually, we do get a lot of complaints from betters about this. And then in the second half of of the meeting, there was sort of other industry stakeholders sort of putting the idea forward that, well... Maybe it is a bit of a problem. Maybe we do need a little bit more transparency from from the operators on this point. And um, I thought as as a starting point for this wider discussion that's inevitably going to happen, it was uh, it was intriguing. Definitely, you know, we're gonna I, we won't subject you all to the full three hour discussion, but I think it would be useful, as Charlie mentioned, to to see a bit of how people framed things. So we're gonna take a second, and you're gonna hear from two people. First, you're gonna hear from Corey Fox who was the representative from FanDuel. Then you're going to hear from Joe Brennan Jr., who's the executive chair of Prime Sportsbook. Even though he is an operator, they don't operate in Massachusetts. And he appeared with the group kind of arguing that limiting was a problem, uh, representing what they were deeming like alternative sports betting models. So check out two sides to the same argument. If these operators in your state are limiting and shutting down winning players, not taking their action, 
what are those players supposed to do? What is their alternative? Yeah. Because they've, you have players that are willingly trying to enter a regulated market, taxed, well-regulated, visible market. And you have the operators who were talking about transparency and security and risk and trying to avoid the next Jante Porter uh, incident. And they're standing there and they're saying no entry. What is that player? What is that citizen supposed to do at that point? All right. Now, I don't know where to begin on this one, but you know what? Let's stick with the operator side of this since uh, that's where, where they started. I will say I was a little, I expected as soon as people started introducing themselves and you saw that nobody was from the trading room and it was compliance and general counsels for people that we weren't going to get much. And I'll be honest, I, I thought they offered up more than I anticipated they would. Yes, I, I I would agree with that. In particular, um, there was a very, very uh, good explanation towards the beginning uh, of the discussion. I think he was uh, Bet MGM's deputy general counsel. And yeah, Jeremy a, Coleman. Yes, he gave a really good overview of um, the instances when Bet MGM and and by and large, all of the other operators would uh, decide to, to limit players. Um, and then, yeah, considering that there were no trading um, trading team representatives, I thought there was a pretty decent level of detail in, involved. Yeah, there was one fun moment where they were kind of like, well, what does the trading team do? And they're like, oh, I can't really speak to that because I'm not on the trading team. And Eileen O'Brien, uh, the commissioner who never lets anything get past her, was like, I can't help but notice no one from this group is on this call. I I would imagine that if they did have traders on the meeting, there would be a lot of uh, executive sessions that yeah. they would be uh, diverting to. <laughs> there would be a lot of the lawyers just hitting the mute button. Yeah, um, yeah well... Uh, I want to go back to what you said about Jeremy Coleman. He kind of put it into four different categories, typically, of what he says BetMGM does when it comes to limiting players. And he said those four categories were essentially betters that pounced on inaccurate lines. So, you know, for example, what happened on Monday when Christian McCaffrey, who for you Euros out there that don't follow football, like the best player in football was a late scratch in Monday Night Football uh, at Bet365, not BetMGM. There was a line where they did not adjust the backup's yardage quickly enough and people jumped on it and put as much money down as humanly possible. So you can do that. But I, I mean, sports bettors that I know always are aware that you're going to be persona non grata very quickly if you keep kind of trying to take advantage of of that you know it's one thing to to be <laughs> slow it's another to you know bet the farm on something when somebody hasn't updated quickly enough i i think that's not the most unreasonable reason to put limits on somebody so that was one um they they take notice uh in his terms, low liquidity, high volatility markets, essentially those extremely niche player props that if you're putting lots of money on those props, which are not really designed, they don't do a lot of handle. It's more to have those for fun. Um, they'll, they'll start flagging your account. They'll notice if I bet $25 every game and then suddenly out of nowhere, I bet a thousand dollars on something, they're going to potentially you know, raise an eyebrow. And then um, the last one was syndicate betting. For those who don't know, syndicate betting can take a couple of different forms. There can be a group of bettors that pool their knowledge to all bet using pooled funds in one account. Or it can be that, you know, you have you and 10 people on 10 different accounts, use 10 different accounts to get half a million dollars down on a game because none of you can get half a million dollars down otherwise. So those are kind of the four reasons. And I'm going to be honest, and maybe I sound like a sports betting chill. These all seem fairly reasonable to be like, yeah, you know, we don't, we're going to limit how much you're allowed to bet when you do this. Yeah. And, and the operators said, you know, 
betters are well within their rights to place bets on on these lines where they might have an advantage or have more knowledge. But at the same time, they are more than entitled to limit how much they can bet because at the end of the day, they are commercial entities and they've got to protect their um, their bottom lines. And that's that's their argument. And I, I must I must say, to a certain extent, yeah, I kind of agree with you, Jess. Yeah, I, I mean, if if not illegal is not the right term, but like for sure, all of these are, are kind of against the the syndicate betting in particular. Some states have regulations and, and laws against this. Others, like you're you're clearly violating the terms of service that you agree to. And like, yes, we all check the box and click the button and don't pay attention to what the terms of service is. But I'm just the the type that like. Yeah, if I said that these are the rules that I agree to, even if I didn't read them, if you tell me I'm breaking the rules, then I'm not going to be that mad or upset when you tell me I, I'm not allowed to do that anymore and I'm being punished. So before we get to the con side, I want to go into one last thing that happened on the operator side of things, which was the discussion around court citing. Was uh, Is this a term you heard for the first time yesterday? No, this is something that I've been, been aware of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with it. For those who are not familiar, court citing is showing up at the athletic event. And again, there's a difference. People going to the Super Bowl might make a better two while playing or while watching the Super Bowl inside the stadium uh, because they're enjoying the fun of it. The court citing practice that they're talking about is someone deliberately like going to the game with the intent of betting as much as they possibly can with frequency on the outcome of events because with the latency of TV feeds and official data feeds, the sports book is is a couple seconds behind. So you can get off bets before um, the feed gets them. Yeah, and there's been instances of people going to these events, taking advantage of that and being on, on the phone to people in other places where they can put bets on at mass. Yeah, because like you you can bet from within the stadium, but like, you know, one of the things I'm sure they would flag is like geolocating you inside of the stadium. But if you're on the phone with someone, you can kind of circumvent that with relatively minimal technology. The court citing thing came up a lot. And in to me, what was the most fascinating part of this entire thing, which actually wasn't even about limiting at all, was when Eileen O'Brien was asking about this practice, she basically said, you know, what? I'm not I'm not going to paraphrase her. I'm going to let her quote. I'm going to quote her directly. As a regulator, one of the concerns I have from a consumer experience and protection point is that I would rather you fix it on your technical end rather than cut off a customer experience. I'll be blunt. When I hear what I hear as a regulator is that maybe you shouldn't be offering the product if the technology is like that and fluctuating so much. So it sure sounds like she thinks operators should not be offering in-game betting, period. Certainly what I picked up from what she was saying as well it's it's fascinating and it's something that O'Brien has mentioned in the past I think she was saying that in the whole building out the regs um, process back in 2023 the end of 2022 this is something that she sort of brought up at that time but yeah to to completely ban or stop in play betting from being a, a thing I don't think you're going to get much uh, buy-in from the operators on that one, considering how much it's uh, it's 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 sort of boomed over the last five years or so. No, and all five, well, four now. I think all of these commissioners are are very sharp and very inquisitive. But I will say, I think with her on this particular issue, there's there's kind of a fundamental lack of understanding that there is no solution. For this, like, I mean, I guess the solution would be that you geofence out the stadium or the arena. But again, you get on your phone and you tell somebody television delays things by a few seconds for, you know, like the FCC mandates this. Mm -hmm. So you have the fact that, like, there will never be 
a, a direct overlap of what someone is seeing in person and what someone is seeing on television. And the vast majority of people are going to watch this on television. So you have to kind of cater to that side of things. Uh, Ken Fuchs of Caesars Digital also pointed out, like, states like yours mandate that we have to use official data feeds. So, like, you can't get mad at us for using a feed that's delayed a few seconds when you mandate that if we want to offer this product, we have to use this. Um, so it, I don't know if she will maybe change her tune once she hears more about it. But there is a very cynical voice in my head that's like, betters, you know, it, be careful what you wish for because you get this meeting and a potential granted long shot is that you get in-game betting banned in the state. Like, good job. <laughs> Hope you're happy. So uh, I don't think that was their intent at all, though. So let's let's talk a bit about the other side. They took a break. They came back with people from it was an interesting group. It was like a couple of RG representatives, a few members of the media. um, and then Richard Schutz, who's a consultant that works with, um, what is it, American Better's Voice? I keep calling it Pro Better's Voice, but that's not right. American Better's Voice, Joe Brennan of Prime Sportsbook, and I think that's about it, right? Am I spacing on anybody else? Um, no, I think that, that was yeah, it. That's, yeah, that's the crew. Of this second group, what was there a person or an argument that kind of stood out to you amongst the rest? Well, first of all, I was shocked and outraged that you weren't um, called up to the panel, Jess. I thought you would have... I had to cover the bingo card I made. I, By the way, if you don't follow me on Twitter to keep this entertaining, made myself a bingo card of things to check off as the meeting was going on. I did not make a bingo, unfortunately. That's a, that's a, that's a crying shame. Um, I, th I thought it was... I thought, actually, the, the argument that... Um, Joe Joe Brennan brought uh, brought forward was, was interesting. That where where are these players going to go? Um, and just that sort of need for a bit of transparency. And the the industry is sort of always talking about you know if we in, increase regulations or prohibit what sort of operators can do, then there's this is a threat of the black market. But um, yeah, I. I I think that that sort of argument was quite interesting. I don't know if there's anything that you particularly picked up on, Jess, that, that you thought was um, particularly sort of jarring with what the operators were saying. Yeah. To quickly respond to the, I think people really resonated with the clip that we played of Joe. And, mm -hmm. and I hear that argument. To be devil's advocate, and I did this on Twitter to some extent and got reamed for it. So why not just open this wound again? I've said this many times. Nobody owes you the right to make a living as a professional sports better. That's not what this industry is about. That's not what the intent of the industry is. If you can, more power to you. However, I think Joe mentioned a couple times, you know, that pro aspiring pros are getting limited for RG reasons and it's not and and the debate of like the the sincerity of the RG concerns is an absolutely fair point but like i don't really care if they're going to be pro betters or not i i don't think that that should be factored in to regulations and i agree that it is frustrating that people that enjoy this and are successful at it have limited options about where they can go that certainly raises an eyebrow and makes me concerned but I live in a state where you are not legally really allowed to play poker in this state. I guess sweepstakes is the closest thing to like a legal entity. I don't – I drive across the river and I'm very lucky I can just drive across the river. But like I have a lot of poker friends that are like, well, I have to play on offshore sites because my state won't legalize this. And I'm just like – I hear you. I feel you. But you're working with an illegal operator. And that's I, I just my sympathy is not there the way it is for some other people that like I I hear your frustration. I get where it's coming from. I don't think it justifies, you know, 
paying or hiring people to to borrow their accounts and circumventing the system like i don't think that that supplants the fact that you're breaking the rules no and i think we've got to sort of point out as well that maybe not a vested interest but but when brennan speaks he speaks as a representative of prime sports book which does sort of do a lot of work with with sharp betters and that's their sort of target market so maybe he's speaking for his sort of for sure his, and, his sort of player base there i think it's great that prime and sport trade and some of these others exist and want to cater to that market i think it's fantastic mm -hmm. um i just don't know you know joe spoke about uh, we have to keep these um uh, they they keep these huge number of markets open and Maynard kind of question, why do you have so many markets if you can't keep on top of them? Because the appetite is for same game parlays. And so you need like a wide range of markets to help, you know, make those bets happen. And, you know, Joe's like, we don't offer that many markets. And and again, if you don't want to, that's great. And I understand there's some exposure to offering all of those markets. I don't think for the average better, the resolution of operators having to shut down hundreds of markets because they're not allowed to limit people is what most betters want. No. And and this is something the operators were saying as well, is that if we if we don't have the limits on the, the those who are more advantaged, then we have to in, impose limits on those recreational betters. And that's not what we want to do because otherwise, you know, again, we have to pull the markets. And as a as these businesses are primarily targeting recreational players, that's of course not what they want to do. It's all about providing entertainment during sports. So yeah, I, it's it's a really, really interesting debate, one that's really going to rumble on in Massachusetts, I think, because the the commission said that this is only the beginning of the conversation. It's, it's going to continue. Yeah, we're running out of time, but quickly, kind of next steps on this. What I think there will be conversations about this potentially more conversations, really in order to actually take action, they would need to draft some sort of regulation. Based on the temperature of the meeting, I would say the regulation that seems to have the most likelihood of getting drafted and, and moving forward is some sort of process where betters are notified your account is being limited for X amount of time or on X amount of markets for X, Y, Z reason. Because um, the regulators seem to really hone in on that. Operators were like, I mean, they usually know. Um, but then the betters that spoke on the second half are like, I don't really know why I'm being limited. I don't bet that much. I, I would like to have that opportunity to understand what happened. So to me, that's probably the most likely end result of this is, okay, we have to notify you why you're being limited. Uh, I think we're a long way off from some sort of wide sweeping regulation that you're just not allowed to do this. I, I call me cynical. No, absolutely agreed. All right. Well, uh, we're not going to go much longer because <laughs> we don't want to turn into an MGC meeting, but you can read more about um, the meeting itself on SBC America's. We've got the recap. We'll put the link to the full meeting in the description below and be sure to just keep checking out all of the other sites in the SBC network for the latest and greatest news from around the online gambling space. Thank you for listening to today's iGaming Daily podcast supported by Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming market. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network or check out the latest edition of the SBC Leaders magazine. Happy reading.